Wherever an army resides, thorns and thistles grow. Weapons are inauspicious instruments, not the instruments of a cultivated person. But if given no choice, the cultivated person will use them. Peace and quiet are the highest ideals. Military victory is not a thing of beauty. Dao De Jing, commonly attributed to Lao Tzu, is one of the most widely translated works ever, along with the Bible, and its influence can be found from popular culture to political statements. Yet, even though the book is immensely popular, it is often badly mistranslated. Furthermore, because its writing style is enigmatic, many people tend to project whatever meaning they wish to find in the statements. Therefore, in this lecture, we will propel some of the biggest misconceptions that people may have toward Taoism, and attempt to analyze the ideas contained in this book by discussing two of the most well-known Taoists and what ideas they proposed. I will also differentiate Taoism from Confucianism and Mohism from the previous lectures to illuminate the discrepancy between different schools and provide a larger picture of the Chinese philosophy. I will also be using both the terms Tao and the Wei interchangeably throughout the lecture. One of the things that philosophy departments all over the Western countries do is that the students are required to know the history of philosophy as a way of training the students in philosophy. Teaching history of philosophy is a way of introducing the agenda of philosophy, questions, the issues, the conception of them by putting it in a historical context. However, what you see on YouTube and often leave out the historical context, so the listeners often do not fully understand why these philosophers said what they said and cannot give the benefit of the doubt to their proposals and proper consideration, which is one of the most important components of philosophical discussions and learning. Just like many other philosophical ideas from the West and the rest of the world, the ideas of Taoism have been part of many engagement, but it has often been taken out of context or misunderstood so much because its background is not properly explained. Taoism has piqued the interest of many people outside of China, and its concepts are known to be similar to those of Buddhism and Stoicism. Many YouTube channels and laypersons will talk about Taoism and they often mention it as though Taoism is a movement founded by Lao Tzu, and its philosophical content directly came from him, similar to the other school of philosophies like Buddhism or Platonism. However, nothing could be farther from the truth. There are no references to Lao Tzu in any text until about 300 years later, and the earliest historian that wrote a biography of him reported sharply contradictory details of Lao Tzu's action, his lifetime, and even his name. When translated, the name Lao Tzu from Chinese, it simply means old master, but not an actual name. So we may ask, who wrote it? Brian Van Orden, chair of the philosophy department of Vassar College, and translator of Chinese philosophical texts. Answer is, no one wrote it. Philological and historical studies of the Tao Te Ching suggest that it is an anthology that records a variety of oral sayings and did not become something like the book we recognize today until the 3rd century BCE. While there are many interpretations of the origin of Lao Tzu and some think of him as the teacher of Confucius, what we know for sure is that the references of Lao Tzu all started after Zhuang Tzu. This is a very important detail that many have failed to mention because when scholars see Tao Te Ching as largely incoherent, they emphasize the differences in messages with regard to the nature of Tao and the political strategies of rulership. In contrast, for those who see the work as largely coherent, they attempt to clarify the apparent consistencies. Therefore, there is a wide array of translations and interpretations of the Tao Te Ching, and this explains why, despite the popularity of the book, the ideas in it are often misunderstood. Therefore, when someone talks about Taoism and discusses Lao Tzu's idea, they are merely transmitting an interpretation of one scholar among many other scholars who have attempted to understand the work of Lao Tzu. Hence, when the ideas of Tao Te Ching are discussed in this video, several interpretations of actual scholars will be provided to let the listeners decide what to do with the information that has been delayed. However, for our purposes of learning, we will treat Lao Tzu as though he was a real person, since 
there are still many things that we can get out of his writings. Another big misconception that people have with Taoism is regarding its status as a religion or a school of philosophy that promoted dialogues between students and fostered logically constructed arguments. So you may see some comments like this that are being shown on the screen right now. This confusion actually stems from the fact that people who have discussed Taoism do not really understand the Chinese language and do not know the Chinese history behind it. So they fail to properly look up the context that these schools emerged in and the historical background behind it. Thus, they end up failing to mention the fact that the Taoism that they often praise and discuss actually has two different versions, the religious version and the philosophy version. They have very little in common with each other. Terry F. Kleeman, a leading scholar of the early texts and history at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the Ivy League universities, wrote Celestial Masters, History and Ritual in Early Taoist Communities. This is the first work in any Western language on the founding of Taoism as a formal religious movement rooted in earlier cosmological benefits, beliefs. In his work, he clarified people's confusion by stating that the word Taoism is horribly vexed because it has to translate to Chinese terms, Dao Jiao and Dao Jia. Dao Jiao is the religion Taoism, while Dao Jia refers to the philosophical works associated with Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu, such as the Tao Te Ching. The two are not really that closely related. Taoist priests don't carry around copies of Tao Te Ching, like a Christian Bible, and that work has little to do with what they teach in temples. They teach a set of rules in morality, but you will find little morality in the Tao Te Ching. Tao Jiao's foundation is usually dated to the year 142 CE in Western China, over 600 years after penmanship of Tao Te Ching, and over 400 years after Zhuang Tzu. He further states that Tao Jiao is a theocracy whose primary beliefs are based around Tian Shi, celestial masters, and is full of very detailed codes of conduct that everyone has to observe. Whereas in Tao Jia, a rigid system of beliefs is often discouraged. Another misconception that people may have regarding Taoism is its very popular message that is known as Wu Wei. It has often been mischaracterized as lazy men's philosophy or been reacted in knee-jerk reaction like, if you really think we shouldn't focus on improving things, please stop taking medicines, using tap water, buying food at the store, and turning the heat on during the winter, then go with the flow if you still like it. These misguided reactions arise because people do not understand the message that Taoist philosophers were sending because the transmitter of Taoism properly and clearly did not explain Taoism. Therefore, we will do our best to explain this concept and dispel some misguided views that people may have toward Taoism. As a philosophy, Taoism can be described as individual deliverance. Taoist, seeing that the world is beyond the point of salvation, they chose to focus on what matters the most to oneself, and that is one's own spiritual elevation. They believe that the way to achieve their goal is by becoming reclusive, living simple lives, hiding their knowledge and their abilities from other people. Their lack of attachment to worldly things kept them from pursuing the extremes of fame, wealth, and power, which often lead to trouble. Some would say that the Taoists adopted an escapist mentality, rejection of the world of turmoil. Like Seneca, the Stoic philosopher who was born a slave and had to go through many hardships in his life, Taoist philosophers also adopted similar attitudes at a time when it was easily possible to incur harsh and unreasonable punishments because of the whims of tyrannical kings. Zhuang Zi often employed examples of people whose legs were amputated, whose foreheads were branded, and whose nose were cut off during the times of the Warring States period, when there would regularly be mass starvation and extreme violence from constant warfare. Therefore, when taking Taoism into consideration from a historical context, one could argue that this mentality actually encourages people to search for true freedom, as it teaches one to forget worldly things such as fame and wealth, and instead to pursue internal tranquility and give people the strength to tolerate the daily harshness of life. Furthermore, because of their general lack of interest in their surroundings, they took more interest in abstract philosophical thinkings, such as the nature of the Tao and the origin of the universe, similar to the pre-Socratic natural philosophers. From Tao Te Ching, we can make up five major themes. 
its content antagonized the corruption, violence, and suffering of their war-torn world. Their contempt toward the governments of the time is illuminated in one of the passages of Tao Te Ching. The court is resplendent, yet the fields are overgrown. The granaries are empty, yet some wear elegant clothes. Fine swords dangle at their sides. They're stuffed with food and drink, and possessed wealth in gross abundance. This is known as taking pride in the robbery. Far is this from the way. However, unlike Confucians and Mohist, who seek to reform the society, Lao Tzu would rather return to a primitive society, which was viewed as a utopia in which people led simple, preliterate, honest, and contented lives. Contrary to the pre-civilization society, civilized society is filled with hypocrisy and self-aggrandizement. Thus, to achieve the ideal values and return to the ancient days, rulers and their subjects, to put into concise words, must practice non-action, acting without self-conscious or self-aggrandizing desires. This theme will be further analyzed in later episodes. One of the ways to practice this non-action. Is by escaping fixation on the often arbitrary distinctions in body and language. We will care less and eventually cease yearning when we detach ourselves to concepts such as wealth and poverty, success and failure. The Tao, something that can neither be transcribed nor described by normal human language, yet a transcendent entity that sustains the world, is the source of guidance for human action, not our self-conscious choice nor the social conventions embodied in language. Knowing the Tao is the highest form of knowledge, since the Tao transcends our human knowledge. Tao Te Ching advocates a kind of mystical knowledge. To further explore the ideas in Taoism, we must first understand the language used to describe Tao. Lao Tzu deployed Tao as both as a noun and a, as a verb. As a noun, it designates either the ultimate and unique metaphysical entity or some general moral principles. As a verb, it can means either to follow, which is manifested in one's behavior, or to tell, which involves the use of language. Because the Tao is what is natural, we should not meddle with it, but rather follow it. If we take action, then it goes against nature, since we are not accepting things as they are. For Taoist, things will go as they are, with or without our interference. Therefore, this philosophy of life also follows that the best ruler is one who gives up embellishment. Embraces simplicity, cast off selfishness, and temper material desires. By doing so, the world will be in order on its own accord. Like Lao Tzu, Zhuang Tzu also engaged in the philosophical examination of the nature of language and its correspondence with reality. He did not choose to elucidate what the Tao is, since he did not think that there is no objective way to settle the dispute. The disputes on the nature of the Tao do not help us advance our knowledge on what the Tao is. Rather, they simply demonstrates how we live in our conception of the world, carrying our prejudiced views, comparing the tenets and aims of Taoism with those of Confucian and Mohism, may put into perspective of each school of philosophy's concerns and help clarify the disagreements between the solutions that they have proposed to solve their contemporary issues. Because of their perspective on the nature of the universe and how the world is supposed to operate according to its nature, they do not share the same humanistic spirit. That shapes Confucianism and Mohism. For the Taoist, animals and inanimate objects cohabit the same part of the world that humans do. In other words, all things have equal value. Hence, heeding our attention only to human affairs contradicts the natural Tao. This may sound similar to the Mohist, who argued that we should see everyone equally. However, unlike the Mohist, Taoists do not endorse love. Instead, they recommend us. They recommend us to detach ourselves from all sorts of love, similar to the position of the Buddhists, since they view that everything is in a transient state of the transformation of Tao. This view that everything in the universe has equal value leads us to the conclusion that even our emotion of happiness and sadness is simply equal in value, and thus we should not stress to desire life or to be anxious for the upcoming inevitability of death. For the Confucians, ritual proprietary in festivals and music shall be commands to transform the values of the society. In contrast, Taoists believe that this approach is misguided, and since the need for transformation implies that there is already corruption in our moral values, meaning that people are already out of touch with the Tao. No amount of moral cultivation is going to solve the inherent problem of people asynchronous with the Tao unless people are in sync with the Tao again. 
The way to do so is by eliminating our desires and denouncing all value distinctions marked by our limited human language. From this approach, the Taoist approach is similar to that of the Mohist, who also call upon people to let go of our pursuit of material possessions and disproving cultural refinements. Taoism, specifically Lao Tzu's philosophy, made a significant contribution to the development of the Chinese philosophy in one of the ways that it led to new conversations and inquiry. For example, his discussion on the origin of the universe or the relation between being and non-being, in particular, led to discussions on further exploring metaphysics. His and Zhuang Zi's teachings on how to live a good life influenced Chinese intellectuals' frame of mind. Confucianism, though it is the molding ideology of Chinese culture for thousands of years, shaping the political structures and social relationships of China and beyond. Taoism, with its emphasis on spiritual elevation and teaching of tranquility, became the mental utopia for intellectuals. Thus, there is a common saying that one should deal with worldly affairs with a Confucian attitude, while retreating to one's own world with a Taoist attitude. People may aim to be outwardly a Confucian, while inwardly a Taoist. Confucianism and Taoism became the yin and yang of Chinese society, two complementary elements in Chinese culture and the Chinese mind. Although Lao Tzu's political ideal society was never realized in Chinese history, and possibly never realizable in any worldly state, it has become an aesthetic prototype in many Chinese paintings, like the one that are displayed on the screen. An ideal captured in the Chinese landscape illuminates a kind of Taoist utopia that is simple, tranquil, and otherworldly.